We started a teaching series two weeks ago called Grace. Most of you were here for the teaching on grace. And last week we had a follow-up teaching called The Purpose of the Law and Righteousness. And um, the emphasis of the teaching on, on the purpose of the law is to help us know that the law does not bring perfection. I still read a place in the book of Hebrews yesterday. It says, the law was not given to make any, anyone perfect. The law of Moses is not given for perfection. The Bible says in the book of John that the law came through Moses. It says, grace and truth came through Jesus. The law came through Moses. It says, grace and truth came through Jesus. If you remember the Mount of Transfiguration, where Jesus took Peter and three disciples with him to the mountain to pray, Peter was one of them. And the Bible says that after he, Jesus prayed to a point whereby his countenance was changed, he was transfigured, and there was an appearance of Elijah and Moses. There was an appearance, if you, how many of you remember the story the, um, in the gospel? And what happened when Elijah and Moses, the Bible says they spoke to Jesus, they, they had a conversation with Jesus. And then Peter woke up from his sleep and he was like, oh my God, like, this is such a beautiful experience. Let's not go down. Let's stay here. We we'll built three tabernacles, one for Jesus, one for Elijah, and one for Moses. And Bible said, didn't even know what he was saying. Because, you know, sometimes you wake up from sleep and uh, you think you have a revelation, but you're actually being spooky. And then Bible says that um, um, Elijah and Moses, or who, who spoke among the two, Bible said there was a voice that came from heaven and said, This is my beloved son. He says, Hear ye him. God was indirectly saying that the era, because Eli, uh, Moses represented the era of the law. After the law, there was the era of the prophet. If you know the Old Testament, the entire Bible is summarized as the law, the prophet, the gospel, and then the epistles, right? Yeah. So before Jesus came, what ruled the people was the law and the prophets. We have major prophet, minor prophet. God used these people to speak to um, everybody. Before the prophet came, there was the law that was like a tutor that led people but at that instance god was indirectly saying now we have moved from the dispensation of trying to get you know to know god or hear god through the prophets or through the law now it is the dispensation of christ that's why bible says a voice came from heaven and said this is my beloved son hear ye him now we are no longer trying to get close to God using the law. We are no longer trying to get close to God through the prophet. You know, before Jesus came, people did not have the spirit of God living in, inside of them because their spirit man was not recreated. How many of you agree with me? So they only had access to God through what the prophets and the priests said. So if they are to go, if they are to go for what now, for example, they will call the prophet. The prophet will use the what we call the um, urim and the thurim to hear what God has to say about that particular war. That should they go on, should they go and fight this battle? And God will say, go. No, not many people had the experience of hearing God because the Holy Ghost was not dwelling inside anybody. The only few people that had the spirit of God upon them were the priest, the prophet, and some of the kings. And that's why David prayed a prayer like Psalm 51 that says, Oh, um, and that was after he had slept with Bathsheba. And that's why the Old Testament, when you are reading the Old Testament, you have to read it through the lens of the new. When you are reading the Old Testament, you have to read it through the lens of the new. In the Old Testament, you will see where they say, okay, if you commit this kind of iniquity, this is the kind of sacrifice you have to make. You have to get a, a ram that is, the, that is the firstborn. You know, you keep it, you do this, and you sacrifice it on the altar, and the priest will take the blood. You don't read the Old Testament now, do you, and say, oh, because you, you stepped on someone's feet now, you want to go and get a turtle dove and sacrifice. You get what I'm saying? So when you are reading the entire Old Testament, you need to read it through the lens of the new. Knowing that, Bible says the law was a shadow of what was to come. It's just like saying, I don't know who Pastor Benjamin is, but they said Pastor Benjamin is coming, and the first thing I saw in Pastor Benjamin was his shadow. Imagine me now grabbing his shadow, his shadow. No, they said Pastor Benjamin is in his room, and I still want to be hugging his shadow. Would that not be foolishness? So the law was a type shadow of what was to come. All the sacrifices they were making in the Old Testament, there was one sacrifice that represented all the, all the sacrifices they made and the one that was still here. And that was why Jesus became the sacrifice. Do you understand now? 
Do you understand? Yes. You know, one of the purpose of the school of Adulam is to ex- establish us in the deeper, you know, truth of the scripture. Let me tell you, if all you know is knowledge, you can know about God and not truly know God. You can know about God and not truly know God. And if all, the knowledge of God we have is just on the surface, there will be days where your, your knowledge will be tested. It is understanding that strengthens your conviction. A lot of believers don't have thorough understanding of the scriptures. And that's why in, 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 on bad days, you know, they get swept off their feet. You know, someone introduced a heresy or you go to a place where someone is preaching what is not consistent with the Bible. You quickly embrace it. Embrace it. Bible says we should not be taught. We are not meant to be tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. When you are being taught correctly, when you understand, your your convictions are being reinforced, and that's why we go deeper in this teaching, so that you don't just know about grace, you don't just know about righteousness, you don't just know about the Bible. You have a solid understanding of what is in it and what God expects from you. Glory to God. Amen. Glory to God. My prayer for you today is that the Lord will cause the eyes of your heart to be enlightened in the name of Jesus. You know, Pastor Benjamin and I have been praying for you. And today I want to teach us on what is called the renewal of the mind. Slash living in victory over sin. Renewal of the mind slash living in victory over sin. Our anchor scripture for this series has been Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8. Bible says, by grace ye are saved through faith. By grace, we are saved through faith. Salvation is by grace, but it is activated by faith. Salvation comes through grace, but it is activated by grace. If you check Acts chapter 20, verse 28, I want someone to read it for me. Uh, faith, Acts 20, verse 28, the New King James Version. Acts 20, verse 28. Acts 20, verse 28. Act 20, verse 28. The authority is key to yourselves and to all the flock, among which the Holy Spirit has made her. Read 32. 32? Yeah. Is it not a commitment to God? Yeah. So now, brethren, I yeah. commend you to God mm-hmm. and to the word of his grace, mm-hmm. which is able to build you up mm-hmm. and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. Thank you. Oh, those, 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 32. 32. those are my two favorite verses in Acts 20, actually. Um, I have some favorite verses inside, but those two stand out, stand out for me. Bible says, dear brethren, this was Paul addressing the elders of the church at Ephesus. He says, dear brethren, I commend you unto God. That was the first thing. And then the second to the, second to the word of his grace. He now said, it is this word of his grace that is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among the same. Let me tell you, it is not every teaching that has the capacity to build you. It is not every teaching. It is not every church that has the, cap- cap- the curriculum of growth. There are some curriculum that are meant to excite you. It is the word of his grace, a deeper understanding. Because if you check through the epistles, the main emphasis of Apostle Paul was the, on the subject of grace, what Christ did, what grace did for us, what grace is doing in us, what grace is doing through us. So he says, I commend you unto God and to the word of his grace. See, I don't want us to be believers that are easily swayed to and fro. Someone teaches this today, or oh, you embrace it, say this is true. And then another person comes with something tomorrow, another thing tomorrow, you say, ah, this is true. So you are confused. So who is right? Is it this person? But when you are built, when you are, it's like your root is down and then you're bearing fruit upward. He says, I commend you unto God and to the word of his grace. I remember few years ago, sometimes back in 2015, I've been born again for a while, since like 2011. But then I was exposed to a legalistic system in code. There are, two, three, there are four kinds of churches. There are churches that are called Old Testamental churches. There are churches where all they focus on is the law. Thou shalt not do this, thou shalt not. They don't even tell you what God wants you to do. They just tell you what God doesn't want you to do. Thou shalt not. They are called Old Testamental churches. There's another type of church that is called cross-testamental churches. These are people that they, 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 they do legalism with grace. They combine the two. So today they tell you what Christ has done for you, but tomorrow they tell you what you still need to do for Christ. Like it's called cross-testamental churches. In those kinds of churches, they, they emphasize legalism even more than what Christ has done. So I was in that kind of a church. They are not 
they are not typically they don't typically teach error but then they teach truth with a bit of you know a bit with a spice of legalism that if you're not thoroughly um establishing your understanding of scripture you will easily be swayed away so the third kind of church is the new testamental church where christ is the focus what christ has done for us what christ is doing in us what christ is doing through us that is a new testamental church and that's the kind of church where you can be built like i said it's not every church that has the capacity to build you in those cross there is no cross testamental church and no testamental church you will always see yourself as a sinner you will never see yourself through the lens of what christ has done the fourth kind of church is called the new century church these are the kind of church where all they teach is motivation there is you know they can teach for 40 minutes and they may not quote one scripture someone in old testamental church they come with fables myths traditions of men Maybe what they watched in uh, a movie yesterday can be the title of a message today. Yeah, that's an Old Testament. The pastor is not even establishing the doctrine of the scripture. They will just see a quote by someone and say, ah, you know, I was going through something yesterday and then that's the message for today. The believers are not rooted in the word of God. That's an Old Testamental church. A new century, a new century church, they are well-branded version of the Old Testament. It can just be like a motivation, like, you know, you can do it. Oh, no, 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 no. Like, everybody's shouting, screaming, glory. The truth is that you're excited. But if you remember the parable of the seed, Bible said there are seeds that fall by the wayside and then birds of the air come. And that's why you see so, so, some of those people, they go, they don't have character. They were in church 30 minutes ago, next 30 minutes, they're already, you know, saying the F word, cursing people up and down. Like, they, you, are, you are wondering, what's the correlation? Now, we are not an Old Testamental church. We are not a cross-testamental church. We, a new century church, they even have beautiful ambience. They teach more on excellence than they teach more on the Bible. The teaching of excellence is not bad. It's still a teaching we we'll do here. But then it's like you presenting your... It's just like saying that uh, all you eat is conflicts. You eat, imagine you eating burger um, for for uh, breakfast, burger for lunch, burger for dinner. It's food, right? You are eating something, right? Your body will grow. It's just like you'll be growing on the wrong side. You get what I'm saying? So diet is very, very important. What diet are you feeding on from time to time? So Apostle Paul said, I commend you unto God and to the word of his grace that is able to build you. If you understand the subject of grace, you will be a built believer. You will grow up spiritually. So I remember when I just got born again, I was in like a cross-testamental church for a very long time. In this kind of church, they don't believe in speaking in tongues. They believe speaking in tongues is reserved from the lead pastor. For the lead pastor, if you speak in tongues, they will tell you that you're under the influence of demonic spirit. And they, but then they teach the Bible. So it's not like they don't teach, but they teach Bible, but then they have some reservations about things they don't understand. So ah, I remember back, back then, if I do I make a little mistake, after every sermon, who we'll sleep down and we'll be crying on the altar, God, I'm sorry, for a sin you committed six months ago that God has forgiven you, we were more sin conscious than we were righteousness conscious. Because sin consciousness will produce a sinful lifestyle. So every time the man of God teaches, it's like he reminds you of the same thing you have repented of. So you still cry, God, God has forgiven you, but you refuse to forgive yourself. So every sermon, what makes the pastor know that his sermon was effective? How many people, again, so you see people giving their life to Christ and taking you back, giving their life to Christ. Like, remember, I'm not against repentance, but if it brings about sin consciousness, there's a difference between godly sorrow and condemnation. There's a difference between godly sorrow and condemnation. Bible says godly sorrow leads us to repentance. Godly sorrow, if a believer makes a mistake, if you sin, if you check 1 John chapter 2, verse 1, Bible says, if any man sin, if a believer sins, he says, we have an advocate with the Father, Christ Jesus, who is the propitiation for our sins, and also not for us only, but also for the entire world. Now, Christ is the propitiation for our sins. The Bible says, if you sin, that means God is not expecting a believer to sin. So, sin is not supposed to be the lifestyle of a believer. But by eventual, you make a mistake. The Bible says there is a propitiation for your sin, which is Christ Jesus. Now, I was going to say something. What did I say before that time? 
You were comparing but you saw as enemy. Thank you. So if a believer sins, something within you should make you feel bad. You do you shouldn't lie and consider it normal. If you ever get to that point, your conscience has become numb. And it, it's a very dangerous place to be. It means that your heart has become hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. So if you're a believer and you, you make a mistake, you call, maybe you, you lied, you, you, are, you are in bitterness, you keep malice, something should convict you. It is called godly soul. It leads you to repentance that, Lord, I know this is not consistent to my nature. I should not have said what I said. There are times you finish a message and the Holy Spirit tells you that example you gave, you were not supposed to give it. And instantly you must repent. Even though everyone, oh, powerful message. Within you, the Holy Spirit corrects you. Next time, don't cite this kind of example. Next time, don't mention this person's name. Next time, don't name this kind of church. Yeah, there are times you're on the pulpit. I remember my spiritual father was preaching a few weeks ago. So he was talking about a song, uh, The Blood of Jesus and all. So he was talking about the song in Yoruba. And then he said, it's not blood, it is covenant. Because the word blood and covenant in Yoruba has the same pronunciation, um, the same spelling but different pronunciation. So he was like, you know, it, the, that hymn, he was talking about a song. You know, the, the song that says, my hope is built on nothing else than Jesus' blood and righteousness. So your he was talking about the than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Says it's more blood than your. He was thinking the Yoruba version of this. And he says it's covenant. My hope is built on not less but Jesus' covenant and righteousness. So he was even saying this, 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 and then he got just got to a point. He stopped. He said, "You know what just happened?" He said, "The Holy Spirit just said I am wrong. That you guys were right <laughs> in the middle of the message. <laughs> that he said the correct." Thing the song says is not that the uh, the blood the covenant and righteousness it is the blood and righteousness. So when a believer makes a mistake, something should convict you. It is called godly sorrow, and Bible says godly sorrow leads us to repentance. But condemnation, godly sorrow is 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 is, is it is it is meant to be at work in believers. But there's something called condemnation. It looks like godly sorrow, but it is not godly sorrow. Condemnation is when the devil tries to guilt trip you based on what you have been forgiven of. The devil tries to give because of you made a mistake. The devil tells you you are no longer qualified to be used by God. That's condemnation. When you are in condemnation, it means that you ought to be discarded. And that's why Bible says in Romans 8 verse 1, it says, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. There's a difference between living in the spirit and walking in the spirit. There's a difference between walking after the flesh and walking after the spirit. I will get there. But God says, as a believer, you are not meant to be living in condemnation. Condemnation is a tool of the enemy. The devil comes to tell you because of your past, you don't deserve a good future. Let's say you've aborted like four times a day, and now you have given your life to Christ. The devil will just keep bringing the thoughts of that past mistake to tell you the reason you are still single is because of your past life. That's condemnation. That is not from God. Bible says if you are in the first two years for not being in condemnation is first being in Christ and then walking after the Spirit. I'm going to get there. Glory to God. So one of the essence of this teaching is to make us more righteousness conscious than we are sin conscious. Sin consciousness will produce a sinful lifestyle. Why righteousness consciousness will produce a right lifestyle? In fact, there's a message I prepared for service tomorrow that I may eventually get to share here. So you know the difference between godly sorrow now. When you do something bad and your heart convicts you, that's godly sorrow. Don't try to discard that feeling. It should lead you to repentance. But when you have repented, but the devil still keeps bringing the thoughts of what you did. Still, he's still guilt tripping you based on what the mistake you made. Now that's condemnation. Don't accept it. Tell the devil, there is therefore now no condemnation for me because I'm in Christ Jesus. I'm no longer walking after the flesh. I am now walking after the spirit. Glory to God. Amen. Glory to God. Amen. Another thing we've established is that sin is first a nature before it's an action. When you did not become a sinner, the day you stole, I must say you have stolen before, but let's assume the first mistake you've ever made in your life was that you stole. Because you don't look like someone that can steal. What kind of, <laughs> what kind of sin do you think we would have committed first? Stealing first. Lying. That's common to everybody. Oh. So, the first time you lied, that lie was not what made you a sinner. What made you a sinner was the sin of Adam. 
I explained in the in the yes. t- yeah. Now that Adamic Adamic sin is what we call the original sin. Yes. Why the sin of action, so lying, stealing, bitterness, unforgiveness, that's what we call the actual sin. So what Jesus dealt with was the original sin. Say with me, original sin. Original sin. And it is that original sin that actually produced the actions of sin, the actual sin. But the question is, why do we still sin, even though our sin nature has been removed? Faith, why do you still feel like when oh, you're driving and someone just is about to go, you just feel like saying the F word and you just, uh, you just remember, oh, I'm a Christian. And you just focus. Why would you drive like that? Something in you wants to just, you know, if you see people that are quiet when they burst, <laughs> when they burst, you'll be like, hey, is it not faith? Is it not faith? Sometimes something just makes you keep your cool when you're, because there are some people that just want to, oh, if you've been to Nigeria, Nigeria, a, a part of Nigeria that is called Lagos in Nigeria. Kaya. If, if, you, if you drive in Lagos, you will almost want to lose your spiritual. You have to be highly spiritual to be a great driver. In La- I mean, I, I was in Lagos before I came to the United States. I know what I'm saying. That You will be on the right hand. Someone would almost want to push you out and still curse you and still hit your car and still make you want to pay for it. Like, you just... Uh, the Bible says that some people are unreasonable. You find all those kind of people in Lagos. Honestly, they will make way where there is no way. They, will, I'm telling you, if they can even, they, if they have to drive through your house to to just get to the they, they, Lagos, anything is anything is possible. Just, anything is possible. And, and that's the place where I was. You know, I had this idea that if I could have, could have, if I could have driven in Lagos or driving in America, I realized that ah, nah, it's a two different ball game. The laws are different. Now, in fact, it's harder to please. Now, let me use this as an example of law. It's harder to please God more in a place where there is law. Because of the because there was lawlessness in Nigeria. You can drive anywhere. There's no police that will stop you. You're on 120 per hour on the place or kilometer per hour on the place where you're supposed to be driving 65 kilometer per hour. Nobody will stop you. Lawlessness, everybody will, is just living anywhere. But here in America, the law says that here is 35 kilometers per hour. The next street might be 20. The next street might be 15. You're paying attention. So the law keeps you in check in a way. I mean, I'm trying to use that to describe why God gave the law and all. So the question is, why do we still sin even after Christ has dealt with the sin nature? This is always the question that comes to the heart of a lot of people when they hear the message of grace. Why? But before I go into why, let me first tell you, establish again that you are a three-part being. You are not just your body, you are a spirit, you have a soul, and you live in a body. And the danger of continuing sin, even after being saved, let me tell you, three dangers of continuing sin after being saved, the effect of sin in the life of a believer. Number one, sin will harden your heart against God. Sin will harden your heart against God. I want someone to open Hebrews 3 verse 13. Hebrews 3 verse 12 to 13. Hebrews 3 verse 12 to 13. Okay. The danger of continuing in sin after being saved. I said number one, sin hardens your heart against God. Hebrews 3. 12 to 13. You, you say it's New King James or uh, NLT, any of the two. Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Hold on. It says, beware, brethren. That means it was addressing believers, not unbelievers. What did he say after that? Lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief. Lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief. And what does that heart cause lead to? The next thing he says. In departing from the living God. In departing from the living God. That means a believer can get to a point whereby he has embraced unbelief and his heart is departing from the living God. The next 13. But exhort one another daily. He says, but exhort one another daily. While it is called today. While it is called today. Lest any of you be hardened Uh through the deceitfulness of sin. Did you see that? It says our hearts can become hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. The danger of continuing in sin is that the more you engage in sin as a believer, it hardens your heart against God. 
that repeated disobedience, it sears your conscience so much that you will get to a point, you begin to do what is bad and you will never even feel bad again. You begin to watch porn and you don't even feel anything again because your heart has grown dull to a point where it has become hardened against God. He now says, beware, brethren, that don't get to this point. Don't, whether you engage in sin so much now, you do something wrong, you say the F word, nothing moves, nothing shakes, you know, you, you, you do many terrible things and you are not even, you don't even feel bad about it. Why, why do people get to this point? It's because if you repeatedly continue in sin, if you repeatedly disobey God, your, your heart becomes hardened. You know, say how to avoid it is by exhorting yourself. The, the word exhortation means to, you know, to encourage one another, to stir up one another with the word of God. And that's why renewing of the mind is not a one-time thing. It's not what you do when you get to church. It's not what you do when you come for prayer meeting. It's a daily walk with the Father. Exhorting one another daily. Your ears are plugged with messages. You're studying the Bible. You're meditating the scripture because your heart has to be connected with the Father. Father. If you ever get to a point where it's disconnected, you're already embracing unbelief. You get to a point. Have you seen people that are powerful believers before on fire, and then they get they tell you, you know that Christianity thing was just a scam. I'm, I don't know. I no longer believe in the Bible. Yes, I used to go to church. Now I'm an atheist. Have you seen people like that? In fact, the guy that's that is like the forefront of is he agnostic or um, ag- agnostic or uh, atheism? In the um, the son of one of the famous evangelical leader in America, I don't know if you guys know John Piper. Oh, he's like a strong evangelical uh, preacher, famous in several years ago. His name is John. Piper. His son is an is an atheist, atheist, agnostic, whatever it is. In fact, at some point, they said he's, he was like the number one person leading champion in atheism on TikTok. You can go and search him out. He's on TikTok. The things he say, you wonder that at what point did it become so cerebral that your father was one of the f- most famous person preaching the Bible, preaching the Christ. One at a time in America. I'm telling you, a famous, if probably your parents will know him, the joint Piper man, because it's not part of this generation. It's not part of this generation. The son that people can get to a point where their hearts become hardened towards God. And it is the deceitfulness of sin that causes it. That if you perpetually live in sin, and there is no godly sorrow leading you to repentance, your conscience is being seared over and over. And then another second, another second danger of continuing sin is that sin, sin will slow you down. It is a weight that will hinder you from running the race God has set before you. Sin will slow you down. It is a weight that will hinder you from running the race God has set before you. I want someone to read Hebrews 12, 1 to 2. Hebrews 12, 1 to 2. Therefore we also, Therefore we also since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, mm-hmm. Hebrews 12, 1 to 2. Yeah. Let us lay aside every weight. Let us lay aside every weight. And the sin, and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and which so easily besets us. And let us run with endurance. Let us run with endurance. The race set the race before us. Set before us. Imagine you want to do a hundred meter dash, and then you carry twenty pounds or fifty pounds of weight, and you are running with someone that is not carrying the fifty pounds of weight. Who will get to the finish line first? Another person. Yeah, because the weight you are carrying will slow. Sin is a weight; it will slow you down. Many people are not walking in purpose because of that that sinful lifestyle. Many people will never get to where God wants them to be or fulfill the call of God upon their life because that is what sin does; it weighs you down. Today, you are repenting from the same sin. You are repenting. You are you are not trying. You are not you are not even desiring to live in victory over it. Sin is a weight; it slows people down in the race of destiny. The third danger of continuing sin that sin will put problems in your life. Sin will put problems in your life. I want um, who has not read scripture here? Um, Sam, read John 5 verse 14. Afterwards, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you have been made well. Sin no more, lest the worst thing come upon you. Do you see that? 
there was a guy Jesus healed of an infirmity. Bible says that when Jesus saw him in the temple, he says, sin no more so that a worse thing does not come upon you. Sin can put problems in your life. Some sicknesses and disease are the result of the mistakes some people have made. For example, if you go on continuing adultery now, even though you have been saved by grace, now you will expose yourself to trans uh, sexually transmitted disease, some emotional garbages. There are many things you will have to, you know, that you will there are some consequences you will be exposed to as a result of that terrible act. Even though God loves you in that adultery, in that uh, your sins have been forgiven, but there will be emotional wounds, emotional garbages, things you will need to disconnect from. You know, you will even be projecting so many things. You sin gives the devil an inroad into our lives. There are many people that died prematurely, not because God wanted them in heaven, but because they did things, they engaged in things that made them, I mean, they were judged instantly for that action. Because I remember the story of a particular man. God told Kenneth Hagin to go and tell him. He says he needs to judge himself. He says, tell him he needs to judge himself. The guy was teaching some truth and then he was already entering into heresies. In fact, two occasions, two different people, he was already entering into heresies. And people have tried to call his attention. They say he does not listen. Kenneth Hagin said he, he went to his church that day. He parked in front of his church. And he saw him having a conversation with him that nobody has tried to talk to this man. He would never listen. Like, when people begin to ex ex exalt um, wrong teachings above right teachings, one, one of the things God does to preserve the body, because they are already a known voice, a global voice, their error can lead many other people into error. So what God does is that God calls them home. Because he knows that if they continue to be on earth, because, I mean, people listen to me, the way I am now, you listen to me. One of the reasons I need to be careful is to, be, to ensure that I'm teaching the right thing. Because the day I begin to dispense one doctrine, I will begin to contaminate the lives of the people that are under me. So for God to avoid that, he quickly calls the minister. There are many people that have died prematurely because God knows that if they continue to stay on earth, their teachings will damage the body. Cancer is a form of growth, but it's a deadly growth to the body. How do you remove cancer? How do you deal with cancer? You remove the cancer cell, but by the time you remove it, you realize that it has spread even to some good cells. That's how some teachings and some meaning. It can start little and begin to spread. And for God to preserve the body and to also preserve the ministry of the minister, he, he calls them home. So there are people that have died prematurely, not because God wanted them here, but because they never judged themselves. Now, the thing is, how do I get to a point where I live in victory over sin? That I'm, I'm not perpetually continuing in a lifestyle that I once lived before. How to renew your mind? Number one is by learning Christ. By learning Christ. How to renew your mind? By learning Christ. By learning Christ. Just the Lord, I mean, there are three stages a believer will go through in your Christian work. There are three stages you will go through in this Christianity. The first is that we must first receive Christ. The second one is that we must first learn Christ. The third one is that Christ has to be formed in us. Sam, what did I say? We must first receive Christ. Yeah. Second, we must learn Christ. The third is that Christ has to be formed in us. These are the three stages of Christianity. You will receive Christ through salvation. The learning of Christ is called education. When Christ is formed in you, it is called transformation. When you receive Christ, what is it called? Salvation. salvation. When you learn Christ, what is it called? Education. When Christ is formed in you, what is it called? Transformation. So these are the three stages of Christianity. If you stay at just the stage one, you will never grow. You will keep living perpetually in a sinful lifestyle. Because salvation is not the end of the journey. It is the beginning of a journey. So Stella, when you receive Christ, glory to God, there is joy in heaven. By grace you have been saved. You didn't have to do anything for your salvation. Glory to God. This is a beautiful truth. 
Now you are just starting a journey. God now expects that you learn Christ. There is an education. There is a new way. When I got to the United States, one of the things I had to do was to learn the culture, the laws of this place. If I have to drive on this road, I cannot drive with my Lagos mentality in America. Here there are lanes. There are no lanes in Nigeria. You can be driving and someone enters your phone, someone pushes you out of it. Like it's just crazy. Now I have to learn that there is called something called order. There is something called law. There is something called police. There is something called, the, you know, the flashing lights. That when the, the, the light is flashing behind you, there is what it means. Like, there are many things I had to relearn in this way. That's how it is too when we come into Christianity. There were things you knew before. Before your soul was used to, your mind, your emotions were used to, you know, cursing people when they do you wrong. You know, your soul was probably used to masturbation. Your mind was used to pornography. Your mind was used to talking behind people, gossiping, all those things. Now that you are in Christ, there is a new learning you need to go through. And that's what the Bible says. Titus 2. Can someone read for us? Titus 2, verse 11 to 12. The New King James Version. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives. Did you see that? He says the grace that brought salvation has appeared unto all men. Titus 2, 11 to 12. He says the grace that brought salvation appeared unto all men. Now when you are saved, he now says it teaches us. There is a learning of Christ that every believer needs. There is an education you need to go through. Sam, Sam, that's why no matter how far your local assembly is or a place where you are being taught correctly the word of God, it is never too far compared to the truth you are being. You are, some of you, if you want to eat now, there are some restaurants you do, you that, come to, that come to mind first. Gifty, when last you do it at the restaurant closest to your house? Well, you know that there is a cheap filet that, yeah, even though there are many Burger Kings, Personally, my husband and personally for me, me, I'm a very choosy person. There is always one particular Burger King that you, you get what I'm saying, right? And no matter how far, you will always go for it. Why must the church you go to, where you are being taught the ways of Christ, be too far for you, be too far from you? Some of you did not go to the school that was closest to your house. Sometimes the closest to your house is not always the best. And this is why in the choosing of church, you don't consider distance, you don't consider money, you consider truth where I'm being fed. If I have to travel two hours every day, I will go. Because there is an education of Christ that I must receive. It is not every church that has that curriculum. Like I said, there are new century churches. The ambience is beautiful, but the teaching of Christ is not proceeding from the pulpit. And so goes the pulpit, so goes the people. So what if you can go after that your favorite burger, or you can go for that your favorite good daddy. You know, she understands what I'm saying. She understands what, understand what I'm saying. If it's not too far, why should the place where you are being taught the truth be too far? So there is a learning of Christ that every believer needs. This is how we renew our mind by learning Christ. First, you receive Christ. If you read Ephesians 4:20, the Bible says you have not so learned Christ. Ephesians 2.20. That means Christ is not just to be received. Christ ought to be learned. I have to learn the culture of the kingdom, the ways of the kingdom. The world will tell you that the way by growing, the way to grow rich is by saving more. The word of God will say there is he that gathers and then tends to poverty. There is he that scatters and then have more than, more than enough. Like the ways of the kingdom are not the ways of this world. There is a lot of unlearning you need to you need to engage in. A lot of new things you need to learn. So repeat after me by learning Christ. By learning Christ. How do you learn Christ? You are taught the word of God. This is let us read the scripture together. It's a long read. I want us to read it one verse, one verse after the other. So everybody will be reading. You'll be rotating it. Ephesians 4. And still, I'm going to start with you. And don't be in a hurry because I want to explain. I want us to read the New Living Translation. Ephesians 4, 17 to 32. The New Living Translation. And I want everybody to read. Ephesians 4, 17 to 32. The Bible says, grace teaches us to deny ungodliness. So grace of God is never a license to sin. Let me know when you're ready. The grace of God is never a license to sin. It teaches you to deny ungodliness. Ephesians 4, 17 to 32. Are you ready? You can start, okay. 
Ephesians 4 verse 17, mm -hmm. the Lord's authority, mm -hmm. I say this, mm -hmm. live no longer as Gentiles do, mm -hmm. for they are hopelessly confused. Yes. Hold on, hold on. Now, the first thing I want you to know that is that this scripture was written to believers. And the Gentiles are people we call unbelievers in our day. You know, I'm telling Paul wrote to believers saying, don't live as unbelievers do. He said because they are hopelessly confused. And why they are confused, that's what he wants to say next. Their minds are full of darkness. Their minds are full of darkness. He did not say their spirit. Uh-huh. They wander far from the life of God hmm. because they have closed their minds and hardened their hearts against Him. Did you see that? Is that all? Yeah. He says, don't live like unbelievers because there is a futility in their minds. And that's why you can be a born again Christian and still be living like an unbeliever. You still have the desires for flesh. You still have the desire to do the things you used to do before you gave your life to Christ. It's because your mind, if you don't renew your mind, you will still believe in carnally. So Apostle Paul was saying, don't, even though now that you are born again, don't live like the Gentiles do. Don't live carnally. Don't be submitted to the dictates of the flesh. He said the reason they are like that is because they are, their foolish minds are darkened. He says they are alienated, they are cut off from the life of God. There is a life God has given us as believers, it's in our spirit. But that life needs to flow into your mind. And that's why renewing of the mind is, is necessary, yes? Next. They have no sense of shame. They have no sense of shame. They live for lustful pleasure. They live for lustful pleasure. And eagerly practice everything. They eagerly practice every kind of impurity. God does not expect you as a believer to live like after the dictates of the flesh. That your actions are not propelled by the impulses of the spirit. That you are no longer, even though you are in the spirit, you are not walking after the flesh. You are walking after the spirit. He says they don't have shame. Anything their body tells them to do. I feel like having sex now. They look for the next guy. I feel like, you know, drinking now. They look for the next bottle of alcohol. They, 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 they are eagerly, they eagerly do things that the flesh dictates to them. Now you have been born of the spirit. The sin nature has been removed. He says your mind needs to come into the understanding of this reality. That I'm no longer moving by the dictates of the flesh. My actions are now being propelled by the impulses of the Holy Ghost. Next. But that isn't what you learned about Christ. Hallelujah. You see the difference? An unbeliever lives that way, but now there is a new life in Christ that needs to be learned. What, did, what does it say next? Since you have heard about Jesus. Since you have heard about Jesus. And have learned the truth that comes from him. You have, see, you didn't just hear about him. You were not just saved. There was a learning that, 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 you, that you were engaged in. There was an education you received. What did he say next? Is throw off your sinful nature and your former way of life. Do you see that? God does not expect you to continue in that old lifestyle. I say you need to throw it away. Uh -huh. It says, which is corrupted by lust and deception. You see, your mind in your mind had absorbed a lot of wrong things before you gave your life to Christ. Now that you're giving your life to Christ, it says, put those things off. The sin nature has been removed, but those bad habits, you need to put them off. They are like, you know, some, some women, they keep clothes they never use. So, um, I'll slim down. I will, I will never do that. I will never do that. I'll slim down. Ah, I like this clothes, here. Eh? You will keep it first year, second year, third year. It's after the sixth year when the clothes is no longer looking good. I say, I, I want to dash this out. I realize if I don't wear a cloth between six months to one year, it's not meant to be in my, it's not meant to be in my closet. Put it off. Just let it go. Say, ah, this... You buy a pouch, a new pouch, you change your pouch, say that one, you keep it, but you never go back to it. You just, we, sometimes we, we, need, we love keeping old stuff. God says it's time to let it go. What's the next verse? 23. Uh, 23. Yeah, 23. Instead, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. Did you see that? Now, now your thoughts are supposed to be different. They are supposed to be, re it says, be renewed in the spirit of your mind. That's the way New King James put it. That your mind needs to go through a renewal just like your spirit has been recreated. That the realities in your spirit need to be transported into your mind. It says, let the spirit renew your thoughts and your desires. That we no longer think the way we used to think. There are times that before you gave your life to Christ, as soon as you see a woman, you, you have already seen her nakedness. You picture it in your mind. Now, Bible says, whatever things are pure, whatsoever things are godly, whatsoever things are... See, these are the things you should think about. 
that your thoughts are being propelled by the Spirit. They are not motions of the flesh. They are dictated by the Holy Ghost. Your desires are now different. I don't wake up one morning and I feel like taking a gun to shoot gifted. It doesn't cross my mind. It never will. I'm not, I'm not thinking new thoughts. I'm thinking differently. My perspective is elevated. I'm not thinking of how to take advantage of the person next to me. I'm thinking of how to be a blessing. Your thoughts now as a believer ought to be different. That's what it's called to renew your mind. What's the next? Mm -hmm. It says, put on your new nature. Uh -huh. It was created to be like God. Truly righteous and holy. Now see the next thing he starts saying. So stop telling lies. Now that you are in Christ, your old nature tells you that it's okay to tell lies. They even brand it. There's some they call white lies. There's some they call. He <laughs> says, so stop telling lies. He was talking to believer. We have to learn the new the culture of the kingdom. We don't tell lies here, whether white or black. Stop telling lies. What's the next thing? Let us tell our neighbors the truth. Tell your neighbors the truth. Uh -huh. For we are all parts of the same body. We are all part of the same body. If I know something that will benefit EHG, I will not hold it back for selfish advantage. Tell the truth. What's the next thing? And don't send my letting anger control you. Ah, my dear, your, your American accent is so thick that mm -hmm. I, can't, I can't hear what you're saying. <laughs> Sorry, come again. You're too fast, and So just... And don't send my letting anger, anger control you. And don't sin by letting anger control you. That means now in this new kingdom, we are not controlled by our anger. We don't let anger get the best of us. Even when we are angry, we don't move. I'm angry now. You begin to break things. You break the TV. You better that, say, that's who I am. That's what I do when I'm angry. You now get married now. Your husband is de dealing with anger issue. You are, you are making your spouse pay for something he did not, he did not do. He said, don't, let, don't sin by letting anger control you. In this kingdom, we are not controlled by anger. We are controlled by the Spirit. That there are times you are, wrong, you are right. The Holy Spirit will still tell you to go and say sorry. Yeah. That's the culture of the kingdom. Yeah. I've you seen, I saw a post on Instagram. You know this girl that does, Ariel Patrick. This girl that does, you know, Christian kids. They said, oh, me on my way to go and tell God what someone did to me. And God says, forgive, like... You know when you want to imagine Drea did something bad and I want to go and report to God and God says go and walk in love instead and you're like, excuse me, that's that's the kingdom way. That even when you are right, sometimes God will still say go and say sorry. Yeah. We have to learn Christ. What's the next thing? Don't let the sun go down while you're going through. See, some people can get mad for Africa. I was telling my husband today how someone was angry with her dad for almost, I think for almost six years or less than, yeah. Until now, she, there are still roots of bitterness within her that she needs to get rid of. Yes, many of us came from dysfunctional backgrounds, but if we don't allow God to heal those emotional wounds, it will affect the way you raise your own family. That because of something your father did to you at a young age, you are finding hard to forgive. I'm telling you, I know the person, I will tell you who the person is. Still battling with the root of bitterness. And all of us pass through the same thing. But the life of God in me, my relationship with God has influenced the way. I mean, like, he has healed me from those things. I no longer see my parents through the lens of what they did to me as a child. But if you, if you don't heal, if, you, and it is your relationship with God that will help you to get rid of all those things. Some people can get angry for a year. They are not talking to you. I know there are times you set boundaries, but then it must not be from the place of malice. So Paul was teaching them, don't let the, because anger will give the devil a foothold in your life. One of the things that gave, that gave the devil access to some people's life was because of anger. Anger. They got mad at it. My husband and I, before we got married, we made a conscious decision together that we would never go to bed hungry at each other. We'll talk about it. We have to, we have to sort it out. Because in marriage there will be disagreement. You can disagree, but you don't have to fight. You can have contrary opinions, but you don't have to box each other. At some point, the one, uh, someone's opinion has to be accepted, and most times it's always the man. <laughs> and as a woman, you have to work in submission, even when your opinions are unaccepted. But you know, I remember there was a time when we wanted to get something in the house. And I was telling him, like, no, 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 we have this to do, we have that to do, we have this to do. I was not angry. I was not happy. I was angry. And I remember I went to the bathroom to, you know, to... I've realized, see, if you work with God, you will have the key to a man's heart. I, I didn't want to because 
I mean, it was a sensitive season. I can't stay mad. I can't be mad at him. I, at the same time, I, be, I felt my opinion was the best. I felt it was not sinful. My so I was in the bathroom. I was, I was basically, and the Holy Spirit gave me an idea. You don't have to do it this way. Just tell him. He says, the heart of kings and princes are in the hands of the Lord at the cause of the river. He directs him to wherever you will. And you feel your opinion is right, but it's not being accepted. Talk to me to change his heart. When I finished meeting, I'm like, ah. And I, I, it just, the Lord just created a window of opportunity. I was like talking about it again. I said, actually, this is my reason. I said, ah, you didn't say that this was your reason. Okay, we'll go with your, we'll go with your opinion. I went with my opinion. It was as easy as that. <laughs> <laughs> I could have gotten mad at him. God, and you know, the ego in a man will say, I'm the man. I'm always right. And both of you will never come to a, 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 a you will never reach a consensus on that, on that particular issue. So instead of getting mad, I'll still be the great wife, the beautiful lady you married. But then I've told God to stir his heart in the favor of your, my own opinion. Because there are times that sometimes men, they don't see things holistically. They are just one directional. But a woman, God has given you the ability. You see the details. Like I, I've cited the example before. When we're going to Nigeria, his own mind is we book a ticket. We enter the plane. We land in Nigeria. We go. Me, I'm already thinking. What are the things we'll pack? What are the things we need? The clothes we wear first week, the clothes we wear second. I'm all, see, a woman thinks holistic. And because of those minute details, you may see things a man is not able to see. So the, if, a, if you don't want to impose your opinion on him, you will always fight in marriage. So one thing about if he doesn't see from my own opinion, I go to God. God, Bible says Christ is the head of every man. And the husband is the head of you. He's my head, but you are his head. I'm reporting my head to the head of God. <laughs> It always works. It works. My dear, it works. It's just that now I am exposing my own secret. Why is he here? It always works. <laughs> we just branched. <laughs> so let's continue. We are learning Christ. Let's not be distracted. Yeah? What is it? Who is it reading the next? For anger gives a foothold to the devil. Anger gives a foothold to the devil. The devil has attacked some people's marriages because they lingered in offense for too long. You got mad at your spouse, you know. Some people will not, they were sleeping as roommates. They turned their backs against each other. No more cuddling, no more talking. They are, they are living in the same house, but they are living as housemates, not as spouses. The anger, devil sees that as a crack. As a, you people want, you like to be angry, I'll be thank you for inviting me. They attacks their children, attacks their finances, attacks their business. They don't know where, they're not, people will not start praying. Feel 40 days fasting and prayer for what? Forgiveness would have prevented offense. Anger gives the devil a foothold in your life. As a believer, we don't linger in anger. You must walk in forgiveness. What's the next? If you're a thief. <laughs> <laughs> ah, if you do Yahoo, Yahoo, that's what we call it in Nigeria. If you are, see, this, it's ready to believe also. There were people that were in church that were still stealing. I'm telling you, people that were in church, they were still stealing. He says, if you are a thief, mm-hmm. quit stealing. He said, quit. Like, I know you used to, it's a lifestyle. There are people that, that they, they, they have a disease called kleptomania. They just cannot help but take something that is not theirs. They just cannot help it. He says, now that you are in the kingdom, it's a different lifestyle. Quit stealing, yes? Instead. Instead. Use your hands for good hard work. Did you see that? Did you see? Use your hands. Go and get a job. Uh-huh. Next. And then give generously to others in need. That means one of the purpose of working is so that you can have something to give other people. It says quit stealing. Next. Who is reading next? We are going to 32. Don't use foul or abusive language. Did you see that? Any small thing. <clears throat> Any small thing. <clears throat> you know what I'm saying? For the people that are listening online, it means you are using the F word. Don't use foul or abusive language. There's a way you talk to people. Uh-huh. Let everything you say be good and helpful. See, this was Paul giving them the curriculum of the kingdom. These things, you don't assume that people will know it. You have to teach it. He says, don't use foul or abusive language. Yes, let everything you say be good and helpful. Be good and helpful. Yes. So that your word will be an encouragement to those who hear them. Your word is meant to be an encouragement. Next. Do not bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit by the way you live. Did you see that? Your lifestyle can grieve the Holy Spirit. Don't bring sorrow to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Ghost can be grieved. He's a person. He has emotions too. He says, don't bring grief to the Holy Ghost by the way you live. What next? Remember, he has identified you as his own. Uh-huh. Guaranteeing that you will be safe on the day of redemption. Thank you. The next? 
Get rid of all bitterness. Hey, see, these are subjects that we can teach each for a whole month. It says, get rid of all bitterness. The way you were treated as a child. Someone abused you sexually. Your parent did this to you. Get rid of all those things. You cannot be in the kingdom and be holding on to the rage of yesterday. You cannot be in the kingdom and be holding on to the offense of yesterday. It says, get rid of all this. It's not consistent with the new nature you have received in Christ. Get rid of all bitterness. Yes? Rage. Rage. Anger. Anger. Harsh words. Harsh words. And slander. And slander. Don't malign people's name behind them. Slander. Some people, you don't, you can't say it to their face, but you can comfortably say it behind them. Don't. The Holy Ghost had to correct me like two weeks ago. My husband and I were going home from church. And then I, I, I was on Instagram. He was driving. Someone's post, a, a minister of God, popped up on my feed, my Instagram feed. And I said, I just said something. And the Holy Ghost, right there on the spot, said, stop it. He convicted my heart. I said, God, I'm sorry. I even if what she's doing is wrong. Bible says to his master, she either falls or stand. And he shall stand, for God is able to make her stand. You don't have the right to judge another man's Sabbath. Some of us, we don't say to their face, but we comfortably say it behind them. He says, get rid of slander. That the only thing you always have to say about people will be something good. That every time someone name comes to your mind, you either pray for them. Even if you know that what they are doing is wrong, it's not to slander or gossip about them. Take it to God and pray, God, help this person. Next. As well as all types of evil behavior. Every other type of evil behavior that is not mentioned. Get rid of these things. He said, then the last. Can say, be kind to each other. Be kind to each other. Show me kindness. Faith. Mm-hmm. More kindness, please. Mm-hmm. Stella, be kind to see. You owe me kindness. That's a debt you'll never be fully able to pay till we go home to win with the Lord. I owe you kindness. You owe me kindness. I owe you love. You owe me love. He said, be kind to each other. Mm-hmm. Tender hearted. Forgiving one another. Forgiving one another. Jesus called for Christ's He says, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. So we forgive because we have been forgiven. We don't forgive so that we can be forgiven. We forgive because we have been forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. See, you renew your mind by learning Christ. Learn the ways of the kingdom. The second thing I'm rounding up now is you renew your mind through meditation. Say with me, meditation. 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 All the things that I said that grace has made available for us. Righteousness, our spiritual authority, our privileges in God were restored, our healing and health. How come we say that we Christ healed us by stripes, but sometimes you still feel sickness in your body? Does it contradict what Christ has done? No. It's because those truths, those realities, they are positional truth. For it to become an experiential truth, you need to meditate it. Because it is meditation that forms it in your consciousness. <laughs> In the realm of the spirit, consciousness is very powerful. If Pastor Benjamin stands now and say, let's say there's someone that's possessed by demonic, by a demon, and he says, we need someone to cast it out. This is an example. I'm not saying that this is a real pictorial scenario. So let's say there, there's someone possessed by them and say, we need two people to cast it out. And let's say, Moi and Pastor, this is going to call Moi and Pastor Benjamin. And Moi comes and says, in the name of Jesus, I cast you out. And the demon looks like, wait till be your name. Paul, I know. Jesus, I know. Who be this one? Like, who are this, this one? Like, um, why? And then Pastor Benjamin comes and says, in the name of Jesus, you false spirit, get out in Jesus' name. Now, the devil does not just respond to your words. The realm of the spirit does not only respond to your word. The realm of the spirit responds to your consciousness. So if when he uses the name of Jesus, and it does not produce the same result. And Pastor Benjamin uses the same result. And it produces re- um, result. Number one, you can think because it's because he's Pastor Benjamin. No, most likely not. It's because the realm of the spirit responds to our consciousness. You can say something and it's not in your consciousness. What will make it powerful is if it is coming from the place of consciousness. And that's why it seems like the spiritual authority of some believers are weaker than another, than another set of people. It's not because the people that are using the name of Jesus and it's working for them. It's not because God loves them more. You see us, you say, well, we are the, you are the healed of the Lord. You are the righteousness of God in Christ. And it feels like you are still struggling with the same thing 
you are still, the same sickness is still battling, is because the word, that reality in your spirit has not entered your consciousness yet. Your conscious, the seat of your mind is the seat of your consciousness. So it is meditation that takes that reality from your spirit and makes it an experiential truth in your mind. I don't know if you get what, you, what I'm saying. That positional truth become experiential truth through meditation. Let me tell you, the current experiences of your life right now, it's not a product of what you just know. It's a product of what is in your consciousness. If you are conscious of sin, you will continue to live in sin. If you are conscious of righteousness, you continue to have a right standing with God. Whatever is in your consciousness will eventually manifest in your life. Drea, Bible says that for him, I know the grace of God, that though he was rich, Christ was rich, yet he became poor. That you through his poverty might become rich. If, you, if, 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 if abundance is not in your consciousness, you will not handle it in your hand. If the husband God has promised you is not in your consciousness, if that promise is not in your consciousness, no matter the amount of scripture you know, it will not be manifested physically. The current experiences of your life, they are not just what you know. They are a product of what is in your consciousness. This is why meditation is very important. It's a subject that many people don't touch a lot. We focus more on knowledge than we focus on understanding. Meditation brings understanding. That every day, you can start with five minutes. You can start with two minutes. That there will be a particular verse of the scripture. Maybe you are struggling with an addiction. And you have been trying to live above it. And everything you've done, you prayed, you fasted, nothing is working. Let me tell you something. There's something called meditative prayer. You can take a scripture like Romans 6, 14. Bible says, sin shall no longer have dominion over me. It is a positional truth. God is not trying to make you, you know, you live above it. Is, it has been done. It has been, like I said, grace has made it. Grace has done it. Grace has made it available. How it will become your own personal experience is when you take that scripture, you're battling with pornography, you're battling with masturbation, you're battling with sexual immorality, you can't go a day without having sex with someone. You take that scripture and every morning you wake up, sin shall no longer have dominion over me. Sin shall no longer have dominion over me. Sin shall, you are not praying it, you are meditating it into your consciousness because if it can enter your consciousness, it will manifest in your physical life. Let me tell you the story of a famous minister in Nigeria. He was addicted to smoking. If I mention his name, you will know him. Most of you might know him. He was addicted to smoking. Smoking. And then he got born again. And because it is your spirit that is recreated, not your body, not your mind, you will still feel like doing it. So he said, I mean, someone taught him these things I'm teaching you. And then he said he would take the cigarette in his hand. It will be stick. <sighs> I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I'm the, I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I'm the right. He said he, 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 he meditated that scripture to the point that there was a day he took the secret. He could not lead it. Because his consciousness had come to a realm that this is no longer consistent to my nature. He wasn't trying to get over smoking. Until he entered his consciousness, it never became an experience. That there is sickness in your body, even though the Bible says you are the healed of the Lord. The reason you are not experiencing it is because it has not entered your consciousness. This is why meditation and confession are very related. Because when you meditate a scripture so much, it becomes your confession. And confession is coming from the place of a reality. It's not just you carrying a scripture. And like you are meditating too, so much that even when you are sleeping, oh, I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Like it has entered your consciousness. Meditation is powerful. Hi. There are two tools the devil uses against believers. Let me round up. The first is deception. The second is ignorance. The first is deception. The second is ignorance. If the devil knows that you don't know something, he will try to use that as a leverage to take advantage of you. The Bible says we are not ignorant of the devices of the enemy, lest he takes advantage of us. That means whatever advantage the devil has over you is as a result of what you are ignorant of. We are not ignorant of the devices of the devil, lest he takes advantage. So whatever advantage the enemy has over a believer is because of what he is ignorant of. 
So it starts with you knowing your realities, knowing your spiritual realities, knowing you are the righteousness of God, knowing you are the healed of the Lord, knowing that you are the wealthy of the Lord, knowing that you have been delivered from affliction. Now, knowledge is not what rules the realm of the spirit. Information is not what rules the realm of the spirit. It is revelation, what is in your consciousness. That until that knowledge becomes a personal revelation, it will not manifest in your life. There's a, there's a message that I prepare for church tomorrow. Let me, it's part of what I'm saying now, but you guys are just privileged to hear your voice. Bible says in Psalm 107 verse 2, he says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Why would God say, he says, he that he has redeemed from the hand of his oppressor, let the redeemed, he did not say, you know, there was someone like that, that scripture say, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Church, say so. <laughs> You get what I'm saying, right? So people shout that, so! <laughs> let the redeemer of the Lord say so. So that's not what the Bible is saying. It says, let the redeemer of the Lord say, I am the redeemed of the Lord. God wants you to, because God wants you to say it till he enters your consciousness. That was why before Abraham had a child, God had to change his name from Abraham, an assumed father, to Abraham, the father of many nations. Because every time someone calls him, he enters his consciousness that he's not a barren man, that he's to father many nations. So before he had you the physical testimony of a child, he had first entered his consciousness that he was the father of many nations. Before you will see the physical reality, ha, of the spiritual realities that has been made available, you must meditate it to your consciousness. See, this is, this is Christianity. I don't know, it's, you know, I don't know how you, your Bible study times, but these are things that, that light bulbs in my, in my study time, I just go, oh God, I am the redeemed of the Lord. I'm the redeemed, I'm the healed of the Lord. Sickness has no hold on me. I may be feeling that symptoms in my body, but my reality is greater than what I feel. I am, you say it till it enters your consciousness. And the realm of the spirits, they can perceive your consciousness. That's why someone says, hey, Jesus, someone will call Jesus one thousand times. It feels like Jesus is dead. Another person will call Jesus. I remember the story of a, of a uh, particular pastor in, uh, in Nigeria, Bishop Oedeko. He said they were going, they were on a narrow road. And then their car was, there was an incoming trailer. You couldn't move to the right, you couldn't move to the left. The, the road could only take a car at once. And it was like, I think a bridge or something. And the trailer was close to them. See, a trailer is bigger than the car, so who will be the victim of the day? The person in the car. He said, the wife was just saying, Jesus, Jesus, blood, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And the bishop just said, woman, is it nurse, is it not? Woman, nurse, is it not? Jesus. <laughs> I'll tell you, he said, whether the Holy Ghost carried the car, they just knew that they were at the other side of the road. And the trailer did not hit them. Once it's not because the realm of the spirit answers to consciousness. Jesus, 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 Jesus. If it's coming from the place of fear, it will not do anything. Yeah, because you can be calling the name of Jesus out of fear, not out of understanding. It is meditation. You just know that by the spirit. I live another. I am the ransom of the Lord. Anywhere I go, I always return. And I return with everlasting joy. There are times we are driving. Now, let me tell you this story. There are times we are driving. Because the mechanic already told us that, oh, your tire is this, you're not supposed to be driving on the mirror. And as my husband is like, the devil will just bring the thought of death. That one of your flowers will just, you know, we just bust on the road and something will happen. And instantly, I, I, I instantly, never let the devil have the final say in your life. Instantly, you must say, I live, I'm not dying. The number of my days I fulfill. That if I have to get home first for that I have to boss it, I will get home. It is a consciousness because if you allow fear, fear will rule your consciousness. And fear attracts the devil. Faith. If you are afraid to fail, the fear of failure will make you fail. If you are afraid to fail, the fear of failure is what will lead to your failure. Not because you are meant to fail, but that fear. And that's one of the things Jesus came to deliver us from. Ah, I am a teacher of God's word, so... Allow me, permit me. I, I know I'm taking a lot of time, but I want you to be grounded in this thing. I don't want you to just be a believer that know you know about the Bible, but you're not experiencing it. Meditation, meditating. How I live in abundance. I live in abundance. For I know the grace of my Lord Jesus Christ. That though he was Kenneth Hagin, he said he took the Pauline scriptures. And for six months, he will go on the pulpit every day, he will pray it and he will confess it for almost six months. He said. His teaching in his church changed. It was a means. I said, people were not coming for midweek service. People were not showing up. He said, he just he, he, he stumbled on the line scripture and he would pray and confess and meditate it so much. He said, two, that I 
it turned into a four. Four started to people started showing up that the way he was teaching, everybody was come and here, come and here. You need to show up in midweek. He said his teaching had radically changed. That he taught better in six months than he had than he had taught in six years. Mm-hmm. Like, ha, Paul, you you can experience this truth, though. they are not positional truth. They are yes, they are positional truth, but they can become your own experiential truth. That you have handled healing, not because someone said it, but because you have seen it in your life. You have handled wealth, not because someone preached about it, but because you have experienced it in your life. A man of God said, you know, Bishop Oyeriko, in it's also a famous bishop in Nigeria, that it, 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 it stood on this particular scripture. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. They said he, he, he confessed it for about a year or four years, and things changed radically in your life. This man of God, I was saying, it, it too, he did like six months. He said he even set an alarm on his phone, like every five, five minutes, you know, the alarm would pop up. He would say to himself, in him was life, and that life was the light of man. See, when this man of God is teaching, the man that I heard it from, when he's teaching, something within you changes, because he's not just preaching what it's communicating spirit. There is a life that has been built in his consciousness that every time he opens his mouth, he's like, you know, there are some people that they teach. Every word is a hit statement. Apostle Senna is like that. How many of you believe? Like, you are trying to write something. They've already said four things that you are trying to catch up. Like, every word is a hit statement. That you can get to that point where the life of God is not just something you read in the scripture. It has become a tangible experience. Glory to God. Amen. Let the redeemed of the Lord say, say, I'm the redeemed of the Lord. I am the redeemed of the Lord. I, am the redeemed of the Lord. I don't just attend redeemed Christian church of God. <laughs> I am the redeemed of the Lord. Then finally, finally, finally. I don't know if I should keep this for next week. Should I? Sure. If you need time to. Yeah. Let me keep this for next week because of time. I want to give him for questions. I feel like teaching it, but I hope that I'll be able to sustain this momentum for now. How many of you enjoyed today's teaching? Yeah. Glory. Yeah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. So. Let me put to the devil. Yeah. It just reminded me of something that came up during my Bible study this week, where I was reading in Luke, it's Luke chapter 4, and the, where Jesus was tempted by the devil. Mm-hmm. <laughs> First of all, it's like, ah, the devil get mine <laughs> like, ah, ah. But then, it's like, okay, so after 40 days, like, he was hungry. Yeah. And when Jesus was on earth it was 100 percent man so the way you feel when you're hungry is how good yeah. imagine 40 days without food mm. the same hunger that made it so sell his best right yes so he was in a position of of weakness vulnerability yeah and the devil came to try his luck yeah and try 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 no work and then in, in the scripture i wanted to open it he said he left and for another opportunity time another opportunity time and yeah. today I was, I was sharing with my sister she reminded me of um, a teaching my dad did where he said the devil is not omnipresent. No, he's not. He's not, and he's not constantly following you. Mm-hmm. He has other people he's trying to follow. Too. Yes. But when you allow sin in your life, it's almost like blood in the water, and mm-hmm. the sharks can smell it, mm-hmm. and then he comes and starts attacking. And mm-hmm. once he gets a foothold, mm-hmm. it can be very difficult to yeah. to get it out. Yeah. So it's it like it's just it's reminding me again. It's like. It's easier, it's actually better if you don't even allow that room at all. Sure. Yeah, that's fine. Thank you for very, that. Very good. Thank you for that. Any other contribution? Any of that? Just like a question. Yeah. Um, you spoke about slander. Yeah. And how you saw a video and the Holy Spirit convicted you not to yeah. say anything negative. Yeah. Or well, um, that's on YouTube um, channels, I know. Yeah. That it's like are you trying to say that those people that um that that point out what is not good mm-hmm. based on the word of God and mm-hmm. trying to say that that's lots of slander. Well, from experience, what I've realized is that those YouTube videos, those people that do those kind of YouTube videos, they are just looking for views and followership because sometimes they pull things out of context. The truth is, the sad truth is that there are many stars that are doing what is wrong. I mean, from the eastern part of Africa, there are a lot of people abusing the office of a prophet. I always say that we shouldn't say anything about it. What you need is to know the truth. And Bible says the truth will set you free. 
now to bring all those people on a public platform and start calling their names that does not bring glory to the best you can do is to intercede for them so you got what i'm saying to zoom in on someone said there was a guy in the bible his name is called apollos bible says apollos was fervent in the spirit he was eloquent he could quote many scriptures and this guy was preaching about but bible says he only knew the baptism of john until priscilla and aquila they saw him and bible says they drew him aside and they taught him the way of god more accurately he did not even know someone there's someone called jesus he did not know about baptism of the Holy Spirit. Apollo thought what he only knew. Now, if someone has seen him now, I said, ah, that guy is just a fake minister of God. You won't know that it's a lack of knowledge. So what if Priscilla and Aquila said, ah, that Apollo guy, don't listen to him. The guy was gifted. The Bible says he was fervent in the spirit. He was eloquent. He, had, he was someone that could command um, an audience. He could command authority. But he was shot. In knowledge, he had limited access to knowledge. Now, those people that are probably saying what is wrong, it's probably as a result of what they know too. The best you can do if you are not in the position to teach them, you can intercede for them. But let me tell you, most of those YouTube um, pictures, uh, say what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm you get what you're saying. Too. Okay. Yeah, saying. Um, I'm, just, I'm just like thinking about the positive side to it because. Um, there's some some videos we talk about um, some things and they actually bring people over like they they um, convince and based on the word of God yeah. they bring people that that were like ignorant about these things to Christ. So it's, true. It's true. Good, now there, there's a balance to it. Someone can address a message without demeaning the minister. They are two different things. Someone is teaching an incomplete truth. I can come. There was a time something happened in the body of Christ. A famous minister, Pastor Kingsley, talked about something about divorce. He released a, a video, it went viral. Now there's an apostle in the body of Christ in Nigeria too that came up and said, Hey, a message has been going viral, this, this, that, this, that. And he brought a proper scriptural perspective to it. Now you can address the message without demeaning the minister. What I'm saying is, you now say, Ah, that man of God, this, that man of God, that. Bible says, Do not judge another man's servant. He says, because to his master, he either falls or stands. He says, and God is able to make him, and he shall stand because God is able to make him stand. I think that's Romans 15 verse 4, right? Uh, no, 14 verse 4. 14 verse 4, thank you. So, I can address the message. Thank you. Yeah, you can point out an error. Someone is teaching, and there was something that happened like a few weeks ago. Even my, in the church, my husband was testing me. He did not know that the phone was not with me. But because when you see error, you can you can, if you know the truth, you can know that this is error. It is the presence of truth that make, makes error exist, right? There is no such thing as two hundred dollar. There is no such thing as a, a fake two hundred dollar bill. Have you seen a fake two hundred dollar bill? Because the real does not exist, right? So the presence of truth in allows room, gives room for perversion. So you can address the message without demeaning the minister. Exactly. That's that's what I was trying to because the um, YouTube channel. Because the pastor he doesn't um, demean, he doesn't like okay. the same thing about the man of God, but he just talks about what and yeah. how they can improve. So, like, I it just I always like follow him, and he doesn't in any way. Um, I feel part of that is also like the, the place of your heart when you're doing that. Because yeah. even, even in just normal correction, it doesn't even have to be something very public. If, like, if it is some, does something that is wrong and you're trying to you know, call her attention to it. Is like, what was your heart in when you, you preach? Yeah. yeah, true. Motive, Motive. Yeah. is important. Okay, so a lot of those um, YouTubers, so they'll take a message, tell them how long, and they'll only copy and paste. If, if one minute or yeah. five minutes. Yes, yes. Oh, yeah, so they take the entire message out of context as opposed to actually mm -hmm. listening to the entire thing. So you have to also be careful about that. Yes, so. yes. Good point, good question. Can you celebrate Jesus? Can you celebrate Jesus? Yeah. This is something to shout about. Yeah. I have a question though. So what's the difference between faith and consciousness? Like Okay. First of all, what did she say? What's the difference between faith and consciousness? Yeah, I've taught you so answer. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So faith like um, we always always say like he always says Faith begins when you know the will of God. Even if you're in faith for something, that thing has to be 
Um, the Bible says the substance of what you are hoping for. Faith is not hope. I don't know if you were here when you thought of faith. Faith is not hope, but it's the substance of what you are hoping for. And evidence that what God has promised you, 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 you now you will have it. Now, Abraham was in faith for a child. But one of the things God had to do was to make sure that promise is not just something he has received, but something that has entered his consciousness for it to enter into his life. That was one of the reasons God had to change his name. Because God wanted that promise of, because Abraham means father of many nations. Until you see yourself as the father, the physical thing, even though you are in faith, the, the promise will not be delivered to you physically. Let me give you an example. There's a book I'm currently writing that I wrote this as a chapter in the book. The ch- God, the God, of, um, God brought the children of Israel out of Egypt, right? Do you agree with me? Mm-hmm. And God said he was bringing them into Canaan, promised land. Mm-hmm. Did God bring them out of Egypt? Yes. Did most of them enter the promised land? Yeah. Why? The Bible says because there was unbelief in their heart. Now, this is the similarity between, or let me say the, the dichotomy and the similarity between faith and consciousness. Now, God had given them a promise that he was going to take them to the promised land. And God demonstrated several signs and wonders to them on the way, just to keep their heart perpetually in faith that that which I promised you, you will get it. When they were close to Canaan, God told Moses, pick out 12 men out of the 12 tribes. Let them go and spy on the land. Why did God have to tell them to spy on the land before allowing them to enter? You already said you are taking them there. Why did you ask them to go and spy? Because God wanted the new land to enter their consciousness even before they get there. If you are in faith, the promise must enter your consciousness before it is delivered to you physically. So God said, send 12 men. Before God will bring a physical manifestation into your life, a physical manifestation of something into your life, he will first make sure that he has entered your full consciousness. Because if he does not enter your consciousness, he cannot enter your life. So they sent 12 men. 10 out of 12 said, ah, we are like grasshoppers before them. This and that. And God was mad. He said, as they have said in my ear, so I will do unto them. And Bible says many of them fell in the wilderness because they could not see themselves as inhabitants, inhabitants of Canaan. They still saw themselves as grasshoppers before. These were people that God gave manna every day. They exper- experienced spectacular miracles. God parted the Red Sea. God brought water out of the rock. All these experiences was to build their faith so that when they get into Canaan, they will know that, yes, this is the promise. But they saw it. Their consciousness, it was hard for them to conceive that, yes, this is the reality of the promise. Because of that, Bible says many of them died in the wilderness. Because if you cannot see it, if it does not enter your consciousness, it cannot enter into your life. So even though God gave them the promise, they could not enter his rest because of their unbelief. That's the similarity and the dichotomy. Faith is not consciousness, but whatever God has promised you must enter your consciousness before it enters into your life. Mm. Hallelujah. Mm. Glory, Glory to God. Glory. If I people, you, if you guys are feeding well, you know, right? You agree with me. You are feeding well. You will see, look at your life in the next six months. <laughs> eyes have been open to see and which the Lord we are grateful. We called upon you at the beginning of this time and you indeed you showed up. Look at the answers. Look at the revelation. Look at the simplicity. Look at your power. Look at the newness. Our lives have changed. We are not the same again. Thank you for this new consciousness that you're bringing us into. This realization. These teachings. Oh, we are grateful. We are grateful. Can you pray for the servant of God that God has used that more anointing, more of God's goodness, more oil, more grace, that she is anointed with fresh oil. Lord continues to supply grace even in her own personal study time. She is the blessed of the Lord. She increases in leaps and in bounds. She grows. She grows. She increases. More oil in her life. Lord, we pray in the name of Jesus. Thank you, faithful Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.